to get us to do, right? So when I was in school, I'm not sure whether I was the one that was being influenced by peer pressure or if I was the one that was being a bad influence. Probably some of both. <laughs> Sometimes I'd get into trouble by getting people to do things maybe that they shouldn't do. Got to confess sometimes. And sometimes I got influenced by other people to do things that I shouldn't do. But do you think peer pressure is always bad? No. Not necessarily. Because we can influence and try to influence people to do the right thing. Can't we? Yeah. Nice job. <laughs> Yes, it doesn't always go bad. Sometimes we can be a good influence on people and we can peer pressure them to do the right thing. Let me tell you where that happens a lot or should happen a lot in the church. This is the place where we want to pressure each other to do the right thing. When the Bible talks about exhorting each other, that's a big word that means kind of pushing people to do the right thing. So that's what we want to do here is to help each other, exhort each other. I don't really like to use the word peer pressure because that's got such a kind of a bad flavor to it, but that's kind of what we're talking about, encouraging each other to do the right thing. So if you're around people that are taking you down the wrong path, is that the right crowd to be around? Probably not. Yeah. So we want to try to make sure we're careful about the people that we're around and try to be around people who are going to move us in a good direction. You guys agree with that? Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good stuff. Now, the thing is, you guys get it? We need to get it too as adults. We still need to make sure that we're around the people that are going to move us in the right direction and pressure us to do the right thing. So let's pray together and we'll pray that God puts us in those good places, all right? Dear Lord, we know that we're not always around people that lead us in the right direction. Sometimes the pressure to do the wrong thing is so convincing that we just end up doing the wrong thing. When we do that, Lord, we ask forgiveness. And Lord, sometimes we're the cause of that and we lead people astray with the things that we say and the things that we do. And for that, Lord, we ask your forgiveness and we pray that you would help us heal those broken relationships that come as a result of that. More than anything, Lord, we ask that you would put us in situations where we can influence each other to do the right thing and be good, have good peer pressure on each other. Help these kids to set a good example for you and the things that they do and help us to set a good example for them. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Autumn, Autumn, I like your hair. We're glad to be here in God's Fellowship and our peer group. Let's sing What a Fellowship. It's on page 1081 if you need the words in the supplement.
our second one. Lord, I lift your name on high. I got the side eye on that one. <laughs> and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians three, fifteen through 17. Perhaps you've heard the word or the phrase groupthink before. Does that ring a bell for anybody? If you've been in certain circles, you may have heard this before. It was influenced by George Orwell in 1984, the book 1984. Orwell used phrases like doublethink and newspeak uh, to describe this dystopian world that he was crafting in that book. But influenced by that, William White Jr. coined this term groupthink. In a 1952 article in Fortune magazine, now White defined groupthink as the process of adopting the perspective of the group, regardless of the validity of that perspective, just to maintain the cohesiveness of the group. Individuals in the group, they accept the party line because they want to belong to the group. They, 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 their desire for harmony and for conformity, it keeps them from questioning what the group believes, the group's perspective. Now, we all want to think that we're independent, right? That we're independent thinkers, that nobody tells us what to believe, uh, that we can evaluate information free from any outside influence. But if our information is all coming from the same source, if, if it only comes from within the group that we're already a part of, then we can find ourselves in something of what they call an echo chamber, where all we hear is the same thing that we're saying, regardless of what group that we're a part of. We'll be more likely to accept the perspective that that group confirms. These are the convictions that we hear all the time. This is called confirmation bias. Uh, conformity and group harmony demand that we value the things that conform to our position over the things that call our position into question. Now, I'm not going to go through into the whole idea of, of validity here, of, of one group's perspective. Sometimes a group has it right. Sometimes a group has it wrong. We know this to be the case. Just because 
the group thinks it doesn't mean it's necessarily wrong. We talked about it with the kids. You can have positive peer pressure just as likely as you can have negative peer pressure. Now, there's been a lot of study about the way that groupthink works, the way it can lead individuals to accepting wrong perspectives, that negative kind of peer pressure, the bad side of groupthink. We seem to be drawn to that. We like to look at the car wreck as we drive by. It's that, 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 that desire to look at the pathology and the aberration of things where it's wrong. Now, sociologists who study this kind of thing, they're fascinated by the way that individuals who are normally rational people, reasonable people, well-thought people, how, how they can adopt some pretty negative, some nasty behavior just because the group says that they should. So they're so focused on this pathological side of, of groupthink. But like we said, there can be a positive side as well, a positive group influence too. The, the basic underlying principle here, though, is this. We want to belong to a group. That's who we are. It's part of our social nature as human creatures. And when we belong to a group, which we want to do, which we'll try to do, then there are certain behaviors, certain practices that the group expects that we embrace if we want to be, continue to be a part of that group. You know what I'm talking about? You felt this, I'm sure. One place or another, you've experienced it. Now, the reason that White published his groupthink article in Fortune magazine is that businesses have paid a lot of attention to this idea of group dynamics. Managers, they've recognized for a long time that all businesses are made up of groups. There's this group and that group and subgroups and overgroups and, and groups of groups. There's management groups and task-oriented groups and groups of teams and workers and, and all that different stuff, different divisions, on and on and on. And because there are naturally groups in any business, and the business of business is doing business, making money, maximizing profits, limiting costs, then paying attention to group dynamics, getting the most out of the group and the important work that they do, it's a worthwhile thing to study, to look at. Now, back in 65, Bruce, Bruce Tuckman, he talked about the stages of group development. He identified four stages, and he labeled them forming. You, may want to, you can write this down if you want. No, you don't have to write it down. He labeled them forming, storming, norming, performing. Kind of catchy, right? Nice rhyming stuff there. I did, this, this is his stuff. He made this up. First, and I'll explain what they are. First, he noted that, that groups are created. They come together. All these disparate people, individuals that are out there, they come together and they make up a group. That's the forming stage. They're, they're usually in response to some issue or a problem or a task that needs to be done. There's a goal to achieve, a purpose to it. Even, even if that purpose is just something as obscure as just being a group. That's society is a group that forms so that it can be a group. Basically, that's its end goal. So there's this goal that, that needs to be a change. Next, after the forming stage, you get the storming stage. The, the group starts to sort itself out, to organize itself, to kind of to kind of figure out what the group believes. And, and if you've been involved in it, you know it can be a little problematic. There can be conflicts. There can be disagreements. There can be all the different opinions. And there's factions that kind of cre are created. And this group, a small subgroup, wants to do this. And that one wants to go another direction. Uh, opinions are discussed. That's the storming stage. And then you come to the norming stage. This one may be the least familiar to us. Norming, that's a phrase that describes the normalization of perspectives, where you accept them in the group as normal. This is what we expect. This is what we agree on. This is what's important to us. The group adopts that normalized, is the phrase, way of doing things. It can either be something the group agrees on, or if there's a leader of the group that it kind of gives it to them and says, this is what's normal. Either way, you norm things. Then once people are all in agreement, largely, because who is ever in a group in total agreement, but once you reach that normalized stage, the group is cohesive, then you can do the work that you started out to do in the first place. That's the performing stage. You got them? Forming, storming, norming, performing. 
Now, sociologists like Tuckman, they just like to put labels on things. That's what people do. It's like, I'm going to put a label on that, and it's going to be like, I came up with it all myself. Now, he's just identifying something that's been around forever, ever since groups. This is just human behavior here. You see it working out all of the time. Take a look at the way that our country was formed, the United States of America, okay? You had a group of colonists who were kind of loosely tied together, but they formed into a group of people that was going to address an issue. In this case, it was, you know, the, the representation without taxation stuff that was going on, and they, they felt like this is right, we need to address it. So they formed, and then there was a lot of different opinions about how they should address it. And so that was the storming stage where they were talking about things and counter arguments and arguments and all the different discussion that happened about it. And then you normalize things and it came out in the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so they finally got to a place where they could put it all on paper and sign their names to it. And then you got about the business of being the country. That's the performing stage. So what, all the stages were right there in that process. The forming, the storming, the norming, and the performing. If you want... You can see it also in the way Jesus started the church. You know, Jesus formed this group of disciples by calling them, you and you and you and Andrew and Peter and James, come and, and follow me, he says. So he creates this group, he forms it. And then there's the storming, all those arguments about who was the most important disciple and what exactly is Jesus trying to do and is, is now the time that you're gonna uh, reestablish Israel as the kingdom. So the storming phase, and Jesus kept hammering at him and saying, no, this is what I want you to believe, this is what I want you to do, this is how I want you to act. That was the norming stage of that. And then you've got that apostolic going into all of the world and making disciples, kicked off at Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's performing. The church is finally being who it's called to be. You can use different labels, but the stages are there. The forming, the storming, the norming, the performing Jesus knew all about this kind of stuff, these group dynamics, even before there was a, a label for it. Everybody likes their own jargon, though. You know, we all have ways of communicating and sharing information. In the business world, they'll use phrases like Tuckman's, forming, storming, and so forth. They talk about things like groupthink and, and dynamics and intra-group interactions. In the church, we have our own language. We, we talk about things like community and family, we talk about things like mutual responsibility and care for each other. We talk about the body and bearing one another's burdens and, and exhortation, the positive peer pressure kind of thing. But we're talking about the same kinds of things, really. Jesus understood groups work together. They influence each other. Paul understands that too. They understand that we are not independent actors, that we're disconnected or free-floating in the world. That's not who we are. We're going to be a part of a group. Always going to be a part of a group. Even if it's just two people. They call that a dyad. A couple. That's a group. We're going to be a part of the group, and we're always going to be influenced by that group. You can't help it. It's going to happen. We're going to be impacted by the issues that relate to conformity and harmony. And there's always going to be this conversation about what we want and what we believe as individuals and what the group wants and what the group believes. And when we belong to a group that has a purpose, like the church, it has a purpose. And when we belong to a group that has a standard of conduct and behavior, like the church, has a standard of conduct and behavior, then the way that we form and storm and norm and perform, that's going to be important for us to keep an eye on. Now, there's an underlying assumption that in the Bible that the people of God is, is going to be a people, plural, not a bunch of individuals who happen to be in the same location at the same time. They will be a cohesive group. When God calls Abraham, there was this promise that Abraham, in response to his faithfulness, would become the ancestor of a great nation, more numerous than the stars in the sky. You see, for good or bad, God deals with groups. God makes promises to people, not to persons. 
just persons. And the same is true in the New Testament. While there's always going to be a certain personal element to salvation, we come to Jesus individually. We, we are not justified because of the group that we belong to. Personal salvation always leads to belonging, to being a part of something greater than just the individual. That, that group identity that was just a part of the cultural soil that the church grew out of. That idea that we are part of a people was part of their thinking, the way they processed information. People didn't have this highly developed sense of individualism that we do today, back when the Bible was written. And all the theological principles that the Bible shares with us were, were formed and developed by the Spirit. The biblical authors, again, inspired by the Spirit, they understood groups. And they understood the dynamics of groups pretty well, even without the labels that we use today. So when Paul writes to the Colossians, he can write to the Colossians. He doesn't have to talk them out of being individuals. They're already part of something bigger than, than themselves. They're already part of a group. They just need to know a little bit about what that group is, what they have become through Jesus and what that group expects. Now, Paul knows that there's some difference between the group that he's calling the Colossians to be a part of and the group that they are called out of. You know who I'm talking about here. The church and the world is the language that Paul uses. Now, he's presented this in other parts of his letters and other places. When he wrote to the Romans, he told them that they should not be conformed to the pattern of the world. Don't let the world influence you. Don't be a part of that group. Instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can be part of this other group, the church. That's group language, isn't it? He's not talking about individuals. He's talking about groups. The world is one group with its own set of norms. The church is another with a whole different set of behavior and, and expectations. And here in Colossians, he's just called them. In this, in, he's just called them to reject the rules and the regulations that would undermine their belief in the sufficiency of Jesus. Set that worldly stuff aside. He says, don't be subject to those things anymore. He's encouraged them to put off these vices that are, that are markers of belonging to a different group than the church. You know, the stuff like the sexual immorality and the anger and the wrath and all that kind of stuff. And he said, put on these virtues, which are not what the world wants you to do, but what the church expects from you, this body that, the, that, that you've become a part of, the kindness, the compassion, the gentleness. So, so far, while he's been writing to the whole church there in Colossae as a group, others and other congregations in the Lycan Valley listening in to him as he writes, his language has been somewhat directed towards individual behavior. You, put these things off. You, put these things on. You personally have been participating in some immoral behavior, whatever it is, some vice, then you need to stop doing that personally. Put them to death, Paul says. And when you stop doing that, then you need to put something else on in its place. Put on a virtue in its place. And this is personal, individual behavior. You can't do it for someone else. You have to do it yourself. But as we've said, because nothing in the Bible ever, uh, the, nothing that is ever said or done in the Bible doesn't have some leading towards a corporate identity, some movement towards a group, Paul doesn't leave it there at the individual level. It's where we are today in these three verses. This is the realm of group dynamics. Since God has broken down all the things that divided people, broken down all the barriers that once said, this is the in-group and this is the out-group. He said it before, things like circumcision and uncircumcision, things like Greek and Jew, things like barbarian and Scythian and slave and free. Since all that is done away with, and has out of the broken remains of these old distinctions created something new, something, a new group, then this new group needs to be different, needs to have some different practices, some different norms, if you will. Individually and personally as part of this new group, they need to put off the vices 
and put on the virtues. Not just the ones Paul explicitly points out here in Colossians 3, but all of the virtues that Jesus lived and modeled and taught and called his followers to embrace. That's the new way of living. That's the new norm for the group. So, first of all, in that 15th verse, he's talking about the peace of Christ. Okay, you see that? Got your Bibles open, right? 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, he says. Now, we've already heard about the peace of Christ in this letter when Paul tells us that Christ has made peace through his blood. Back in chapter 1, verse 20, it's where he said that. In, that. in that verse, Paul calls attention to the idea of reconciliation. That's the goal. That's what needs to happen is reconciliation. We're in this broken relationship with God. We have severed our connection with God because of our willful, sinful behavior. We are distanced and separated. And we need to be reconciled. We need to be brought back together. That brokenness needs to be healed. And it happens through the blood of Christ shed on the cross. And through that, we enter this restored relationship with God. That's peacemaking. Peacemaking is what we're talking about. Peace between God and human creatures. But the peace isn't just between God and human creatures. In Ephesians 2, Jesus talks about the way, or Paul talks about the way that Jesus has also broken down the things that divide people. The broken relationships between people are also healed in Jesus. But now, he says, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility can i see where he's going here i hope so when paul talks about the peace of christ he's talking about the reconciling power of jesus the way that jesus can restore broken relationships the way that jesus can bring people who were once separated together Humanity and God, humanity and humanity. You see, for Paul, the peace of Christ is not about the absence of conflict. Okay? When we talk about peace in the world, we're basically saying, well, we're not at war. <laughs> That's basically the, 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 the long and short of it. We're not actually hitting each other with sticks. We're not actually punching each other in the face. We're not actually shooting at each other or blowing each other up. That's peace. It's not the peace of Christ. It's not what he's talking about. It may be part of it, but that's a shallow, shallow thing compared to what Jesus can do for us. See, for Jesus, the problem isn't the open conflict. The open conflict is a symptom of a deeper division, a separation, a fracture between people and between people and God. Division itself is the problem. Peace is not possible when there is division. Peace is not possible when there is separation. When we are distanced from each other, that is not peace. That is not reconciliation. And so when he talks about the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, what he's talking about is letting Christ, his reconciling power, make the decision for us. That word rule in the Greek, it means arbitrate. Like an a umpire would rule on a call in a, in a ball game. It's not, it's not necessarily the idea of being lord over, although there's an element to that as well. It is, this is the way this needs to work out. This is the call. This is the arbitrated decision that we're talking about. When there's conflict, when there's a potential division, then the reconciling peace of Jesus needs to make the call. Lord, what do we do here? Well, how do you reconcile? How do you come together? How do you become one as I have made you one? This is the question that we need to be asking, not whether this person is right or that person is right. It's not about being right. It's about being in relationship. It's the peace of Jesus 
that restores us to the Father and us to each other. It's that peace that calls us into one body, what we're supposed to be. And Paul says that peace needs to continually, in all things, rule in our hearts, be in charge in our hearts, make the call in our hearts. Our decision-making has to be influenced by the peace of Christ. Reconciliation, mutual forgiveness, that is the priority in the church. You can't fix anything else unless you try that first. Now this isn't to say that we're not going to have disagreements. <laughs> if you've been a part of a group, even a dyad, a couple, then you're going to have disagreements. Right? I don't know, maybe it's just me. I think disagreements are inevitable. We're probably always in multiple stages of Tuckman's different labels. We're always forming, storming, norming, performing, and there's always something going on where we're like, boy, I wish we could be a little bit more in agreement here. It'd be nice if we were able to get past into that norming stage and even get onto the performing stage, but so often we find ourselves in the storming stage all the time where we're debating this and arguing about that. This is where verse 16 comes in. This is where the word of Christ enters the picture. In order for us to find that norm, that normal, accepted, agreed upon conduct that we need to have in the church and how we should treat each other, those expectations, those behaviors, those patterns, those practices, we need to know what Jesus is calling us to. I will hit on this over and over and over. We need to know the Word. We need to know what the Bible says. We need to know what it says about Jesus. We need to know what Jesus tells us in his own words. We need to know what the Spirit reveals to us about Jesus through the Bible. If we don't know that, how can we know what we're supposed to do? How can we know what proper behavior is in the church if we don't know what Jesus has told us to do? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Not in an impoverished way. Not in some little tiny corner of our hearts. Richly. Let it be so abundant in your heart, in your mind, that at a drop of a hat, you know what it is that Jesus wants you to do. When the word of Christ dwells in us richly, then these group norms, the normalized behavior that are communicated to us, are shaped by Christ. We know what Jesus wants us to do. And we know because we follow Jesus that that is the right thing to do. That is the norm. That is the expected behavior. Now here's where that idea of groupthink can be positive. It's the positive peer pressure that we're talking about. When the whole group of the church, when all, the, all of God's people have the word of Christ dwelling in them richly, when we know what it is that God wants us to do and expects us to do because we read it, read it just this morning, then we can go about forming these norms within the group. We get past the arguments, we get past the storming, and we say, you know what, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to behave. We can communicate that because we know it through our teaching, through our admonition, as well as through those gratitude-infused practices of singing spiritual songs and hymns and psalms. See, we have to understand how influential we can be on each other and for either good or bad. Back in the late 50s, a sociologist, Solomon Ash, he performed an experiment to illustrate the power of group suggestion. So he got a little group of people together, about six people or so, and he showed them two cards. On the first card, I wish I had the cards to show you, but I don't. On the first card, was, there were three parallel lines, each of a different length. There was line A and line B and line C. Okay? On the second card, there was a single line. And that single line matched one of the three options on the first card exactly. 
Not kind of close, exactly. Okay, so he shows the group the first card, and then he shows the group the second card, and he asks the question, which of the card lines on the first card matches this line that I'm showing you? Now, here's the tricky part. Everybody in the group, except for one person, was in on it. And everybody in the group responded incorrectly. Okay, let's say that the right answer was B. And they kept saying A. No, A is the one. Yeah, I agree. A is the one. A is the one. A is the one. And it clearly was not the one. It was not the same. Here's the deal. That last person that was not in on it, one-third of the time, 33% of the time, that person answered in line with the group, even though the group was wrong. Okay, this is not rocket science. <laughs> it's obvious which one it is. It doesn't take a mental genius to figure it out, and yet one-third of the time, that person valued conformity to accuracy. That's scary. Again, <laughs> I'm not kids in peer pressure. Conformity drives our choices so easily that you will actually agree with people that are clearly wrong just to maintain the group cohesiveness and harmony. It's a powerful tool, a powerful thing, this desire for conformity. Just think about how powerful that is if it could be used for good. If we could try to influence people to make the choice, not only the, the choice that we as a group feel is correct, but the one that is revealed to us through Scripture as correct. I mean, what if that group said, hey, it's B, and it is B, and that last person goes, I can agree to that because not only am I conforming to the expectations and, the, and the, the ideas of the group, but I can clearly see that that is the correct answer. What if we did that in the church? What if we influence people in that way? Now, I'm not saying that we need to accept the example of Jesus just because the group says we should. I mean, you, that, that can go off the rails pretty readily. And Jesus' example is, pretty, is plenty strong on its own. It is true. It is right. What I'm saying here is that group dynamics are a powerful thing and we should be sure that we're creating norms in the church, expectations in the church that are fully in line with the one who is the head of the church. And churches sometimes stumble and bring other things in. That's what Paul is warning us about. Don't let those things creep in. But to do that, we need the word of Christ to dwell in us richly. Finally, now we're on to verse 17 here. We should understand the scope of the performing stage. That's where we're at. Now, once we've created that Christ-shaped norm within the community, that, that expectation, we need to take that norm out into the world. We can't leave it here. It can't be just about what happens in this community, in this space, in everything that we do. I'm going to just take a guess here. You guys are going to do something later today, right? You're going to do something. And you'll do something tomorrow. And you'll do something the day after that. Those things don't happen here necessarily. They're happening out in the world. And, and Paul is saying, everything that you do and everything that you say, do all in the name of Christ. All in the name of the Lord Jesus. In everything we do, whether in word or deed, Christ needs to shine through. So that when people look at us, they see Jesus. Now that means that we do have to have the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts, making the call for us. It means we need to have the word of Christ dwelling richly in us so that we can exhibit what we know. And because the, the accepted norms of this community of believers is so Christ-like, everything that this community does, either individually or corporately, is done with the blessing and under the authority of Jesus in his name. I'm going to tell you this. People talk about saving people, you know, getting people saved. 
sharing the gospel with people, trying to get people to, that's evangelism. And I will tell you this, they're the most powerful, the most profound, the most deeply effective evangelical tool that we have at our disposal are lives that are so steeped in the peace and the word and the name of Jesus that people can't help but see Jesus when they see us. If we really want to move this kingdom forward, we will do what Jesus tells us to do. Live the way Jesus tells us to live in all things. Whatever we say, whatever we do, we'll do all in the name of Jesus. Here's our points. We belong to groups, right? We belong to groups. Count up the number of groups you belong to right now. You probably don't have enough fingers. Probably a lot. And we belong to groups. It's part of being human. And those groups can either be a positive influence on us or a negative influence on us. And our desire for harmony within that group is going to be a powerful driving force. If that group consistently makes choices that are against the known will of God, we're going to go along with it if we're a part of that group. It will happen. I don't care how strong you think you are. Group conformity is a powerful influence for good or bad. Now Paul wants the Colossians to let the group the community, the, 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 the body of believers to be a force for good, to encourage and exhort. But it can only be a force for good. It can only influence positively if it allows Jesus to decide what that group's norms will be. What is normal for that group. The church will only be that redeeming and reconciling body when it recognizes Jesus as its head And lets the peace and the word and the name of Jesus be such a part of its collective life that the will of the church is indistinguishable from the will of Jesus. I mean, if we want to go in a different direction than what Jesus is doing, we're missing it. And we have to personally commit to the norms that Jesus gives us in order for those norms to become the norms of the body. So each one of us has to decide, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. That's who I'm going to be. You see, we have a responsibility to each other. Each one of you here has a responsibility to your sisters and brothers to let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, And to commit to doing everything, whether word or deed, in the name of Jesus. And when we do that, then we have something to be thankful for. We can give thanks to the Father through Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, We are grateful for your everlasting patience with us. We struggle day after day after day to make the things that are important to you important to us. For our divided allegiance and loyalty, we ask your forgiveness. Give us a single-minded devotion to you. And Lord, for those times when we've led others astray, when we have not been a Christ-shaped influence on our sisters and brothers, when we have encouraged them to argue, to split, to divide, when we've drawn lines and said, this is right and that is wrong, and we're over here and they're over there, Lord, we ask your forgiveness. When we haven't made a restored relationship, a priority. When we haven't prioritized forgiveness, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, we ask that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to be who we need to be as your people, to take on the norms that Jesus exhibited in his life and taught us and the 
things that he has called us to, help them to make them normal in our individual hearts and in this community. We know that you are with us and you have given us that strength and so we claim it as our own so that we can be the people that you want us to be and we can do all, whether in word or deed, in the name of our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. The words are at the bottom of your page if you need them. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together. with me once again. Lord, we ask your blessing on these, your people. You've called them together. You've gave them work and you've given them the tools that they need to do what you would have them do. Give them the strength and the commitment that they also need. Take us into the world. Help us to show your love to others and bring us together again so that we may worship you. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. You may go in peace.